You're going to love this. This character can hit, can be hit, can parry and repost. It also has stamina and HP pools and usages for them. And its codebase has zero signal keywords. There is a code in the description, but the video contains architecture decisions narrated, so you're welcome. Up till this moment, our character controller had a good time. It only had player inputs and jumped across an empty level. But sometime you'll have to leave your empty home and our character has to face enemies. The outer world contains scary people that you need to communicate somehow. And Godel's analog of following questionable manly man charisma guides from YouTube is to create a bunch of signals attached to literally every of your systems, or God forbid, to create a global logic layer for entities communication with a cursed name like Game Manager. The signal plague root cause is incomplete understanding of game logic flow. Point 1. As a character is a state machine, only one entity rules on what reaction would be. It is the current state of the machine. And if we only have one entity, then we ain't broadcast anything, we can just call that entity to react, so at least no signals necessary. Point 2. The game is ultimately discrete. Time is not continuous. It is measured by physics update intervals. I couldn't find a concrete argument that breaks the system if it transitions multiple times per frame, but as a general intuition, if our state gets to execute on enter behavior and on exit behavior, it better execute at least one update cycle. And designing those to be executed on physical frame and then spamming them mid frame is certainly not okay. What I suggest instead is to maintain the one frame management for all frame it assigned to and to buffer actions to decide what we want to do with them on the next transition logic invoke. When transition comes, we always ask three questions. Does something from the past forces us to transition somewhere? If not, does something contextual from the present modify our inputs? And finally, if nothing above, what vanilla state wants to default to? So what I did is I renamed all previously overridden check relevances of our states to default lifecycle. Then I modified the state base to have an actually callable tra check transition that implements mentioned steps. Now when we learn how to talk with people, our problems have just begun. You'll quickly find that instead of a nice conversation, them bombarding you with questions about the things you didn't know about yourself earlier and didn't even wanted to. We need to learn how to answer them effectively, not the easiest task. These parameters have unique behaviors in every state and often are changed in time. I want to show two methods of conveniently doing it. Method 1. Simpler, quicker, but less scalable and works best if your animations have a single window of something. Have a default boolean value, then create two parameters for a window that changes it. Then your getter for this value just returns the default if the state works outside of state window and vice versa. This approach works best if you have very little parameters with a simple behaviors, platformers probably. But in a complex 3D fighting environment, number of flux is growing quickly. So method 2. This nuts will be cracked with an industrial asphalt roller. I briefly mentioned the backend animations method in the second episode, now let's incorporate it into our project. Create another animation player node. This animation player won't ever play anything. This is our behaviors parameters database interface. Create here all the parameters you want. Now you can create an animation that changes them and set it for units. You need an animation per state with all tracks. The process is tedious and boring, such as life. You can make it faster by creating a template with all flags and duplicating it. Now. I can't stress it enough, do not play these animations. Instead, only ask them about the hypothetical parameter status at a given time, if it was playing. The time argument is obviously the time of the state being in charge. And by the way, it will totally work without this node on top, all this can be written inside the animation player script, it's just me being an encapsulation freak. Now the only thing we need in the state code is to create a single string getters for the parameters. With these high-level functions prepared, we are ready to narrate our reactions code. And as we started to make our base state logic heavy class, let's also define default behaviors. I am doing it, because I feel I will have much more moves than I will have reactions. For example, every parable weapon strike transitions into a single parried state on successful parry. Or most of our states react on being hit universally, they check for interruptibility frames and do or don't get stuck. I always can override these functions if some states need a custom. Let's finally hit something. On a surface level, we need an attacker with a weapon and the victim with a hitbox. But again, we'll face some challenges. 
how to build attacker to victim communication. Surely we can call react on hit method, but what if that method decides the hit was parried and we need attacker to bounce off? And also, strike is a last in action, but the hit is one frame event. Our colliders aren't so bright, they just detect the collision between two areas, but we need it to be detected only during the attacking animation, not to be hit by an idle hand. And what is more frightening, we want only one hit detection per strike animation per entity, to not get damage every frame the weapon is colliding with a hitbox. We need some messaging protocols. First, let's create a hitbox for our character. This hitbox wants to follow our root bone and is used for battle purposes. Our weapons currently are areas, so connect area entered signal to some callback. For now, let's just make sure our hitbox senses the weapons. Nice. Now we need a way to filter the contacts with weapon from all other ones. Check if it is a weapon, then make sure it's not our own weapon that we also sense. Then we'll need attack specific fields, and it's logical to store them inside the weapon. Let's create a flag for deciding between casual animation and a strike. Then, to get hit once per attack, let's create a list of victims on the weapon. If the hitbox doesn't find itself here, it registers the contact, but also writes itself into the list to ignore all further contacts. From the other side, this contact contacts list is being cleared by our attack moves at the end of their life cycle to be able to hit the enemy by next attacks. The attacking flag is obviously managed by the moves as well. Now let's create a small class for holding the hit information. For now it will have only three fields. Damage, hit source animation for debug purposes and the flag that tells if the hit is parable. For the information to be actual, this package needs to be formed when the hit happens, so the move gets the form hit package function. For now let's override it inside all of our attacking states, we will find the base implementation later. This little package contains the link to the weapon, and the weapon knows its holder's current state. As so, we created a single usage communication line between a attackers and victims' current states. The rest is trivial. Player inputs an attack, the attack states manipulates the weapon into being detectable hurting collider, if the collision with someone's hitbox happens, the attacking move forms a hit package, which the hitbox routes to the current move on its base. On the current move, some methods being called, be it a reaction on hit, on projectile or whatever. Then, if something interesting, like parries, reflections or grabs happens during this reaction, the reaction move calls the correspondent attacking move to react on this reaction. With the core done, specifics will be a cakewalk. To emulate somewhat plausible animation of the parry, I used this block animation from Mixamo and play with sliders. My stagger and bean parry animations are these ones. The repost animation I couldn't find and used this two-handed heavy hit. For educational purposes, I am filthy casually in these pairing windows. But I want to highlight how graphical and almost unfairly easy this backend animation approach makes our balancing routine. Here's the new code for a slash attack. The pairing action overrides the react on hit method to consult its pairing windows and if triggered returns the call to the sender. In a complex MOBA or RPG environment, you'll probably want to recall the sender on every hit with a lot of information like damage dealt, status is procced, etc. to trigger some juicy vampirisms or other resource mechanics. And as we are using packages to hold that information, don't forget to delete them to avoid memory leaks. Speaking about resources, it's finally time to implement a core mechanic of being able to not being able. Resource system is obviously another layer of model. Let's create and add some basic resources, health and stamina. If I could, I would privately the shit out of them, to not modify them uncontrollable accidentally. But I can't, so let's create some pseudo setters, and I divided them into loose and gain for code narration purposes. I am stressing the importance of these setters to highlight the encapsulation bonuses once again. Your states to your resource system is many to one relation, but your resource system to your current state is one to one. If you had hundreds of states managing damage in React on Hit, you'd need a hundred of duplicated dev checks in transition logic. But if you can harness the power of project code guidelines and force yourself and your colleagues to only manage damage in the resource system, you will need only one dev check that can automatically proc the dev force move into your current state transition logic. But here. The heavy lifting comes. We want two things from our resources. We want them to update and we want them to validate our transition logic. When updating, I don't want it to be too far from current state up updating because I can imagine a world where my regeneration is dependent on the current state. So we want to do something like this. To make things prettier, what I will do is I define the base moves update resources function in which I delegate the job to the resources. This way I can have my default regenerations be defined in the resource class, but I am saving the right to redefine this function in some moves errors in the future to change things, for example, to stop stamina from regenerating under a shield block. Now transition validation. Where must we put it? If input forbids something, I want the forbidden state to not even get to call on enter, right? So resources want to be something like a combat system layer that deletes invalid inputs from actions array. Hold on. 
But what if I'm in a roll state and have 10 stamina? My slash one attack costs 12 stamina, so the resources system deletes it from info package. But I'm in a roll state and the slash one is a trigger to my roll attack that can cost 8 stamina and be perfectly legal. So resource validation happens somewhere here. If we are changing our resources properly, it hasn't anything to add to our first move. No combos. We can't check resources before because of say troll attack counter argument, but at the same time, if we have our combo of choice and then resources system invalidates it, then our flow is kinda screwed. Imagine some DMC style combat, maybe somewhere inside this cycle we had a combo that had lower priority but could be executed. We need to check resources here in the combos. Okay, but default life cycle needs it as well. Imagine sprint. Even without any attacks, I want my sprint to end on zero stamina, so resources are in the default life cycle as well. And this is the set punchline. Our character is its resources. Yes, the resources need their own update. Yes, we need to ask resources when calculating combos. Yet we need to consult them in the default transition cycle, and in updates, and in reactions, no matter what we do. From now on, we need an approving resolution node from the resource mafia and there won't be a single line solution. The best thing we can do is to create some high level methods to trim the bureaucracy. Also, I'll stress your attention on default in transition. Earlier we were choosing the input with the highest priority in the input actions on animation ends. Now we are choosing the input with the highest priority that we can also pay for. And I will continue the trend of base move devouring functionality by shoving it into another high level method abstraction. Beautiful. Sprint now eats stamina and self exits if run out of it. Strikes now cause stamina and do actual damage to HP pool. Zero and less HP lead to force death move. For developing reasons, my death is fake and only lingers for 3 seconds before transitioning to idle and restoring HP. Finally, for the people who watch this as a tutorial series, I have two debts to pay. First one is the reactions. Right now we are reacting on hit with internal move methods, but you can remember me saying the stagger is a combo that can be instantiated as a scene. I am working on a project that takes this character building system and moves it from a code heavy one to powerful almost visual framework that installed deeply into the Godot editor and declares many things with node parenting and export tools. But I understood that it either will be a fast and bad video or it will be a banger video in about a month and it's simply too much. For now, please forgive me and embrace the basic workflow. Anyway, nothing ever went bad from a bit of code understanding. Second bit is the root motion update in animations. I remember saying that strikes must update with root motion and that current strikes have no update. I got pointed out that although the third hit in the slash series does return to initial position, it has a little bit of root motion. I also gave you the direction to use the root motion approach from the documentation, but I want to give a small commentary on it. Selecting the root motion track ultimately in places our root. To only do it inside one move, you can select the root motion track on enter and deselect it on exit. Second point is this wording in the documentation. I actually consider myself not so good in Godot still, and I can't be 100% certain what do they want to say by this phrase. And I didn't read the source code. But the documentation does not specify the time period of accumulated velocity and I suspect the worst. It can actually use something like last animation update times difference. I don't want my so-called backend model depend on animator more than it needs to. So let's implement the root motion ourselves. It's a good exercise and we will get more control. Following the exact instructions the documentation gives us, calculate the delta position vector, then rotate it in the way our character looks. Then we have the way and the time, so we can get the velocity. Our delta time is obviously just the delta, and the two positions of the root node are two points in time. One is literally now, and the other one is now minus delta. We did all the same, but in a backend animation way that is independent of animation being played. And the neat little tweak I want to do is I want to cancel the vertical component of our root velocity. Without this tweak, our first strike will not be on floor from Godot's perspective all the time during the animation. And what we got then floor in it is our is on floor is actually working properly and can be used. For example, if it senses the gap below, it can start falling and cue the meter as runs do. Look at our beautiful first strike now. It can be interrupted in the window of animation and fall. And the last comment I want to give is on move airs signification. Almost all of them are nodes with unique scripts right now, but they can be turned into a scene in two clicks. What is more interesting is why and when do we want to do it? Stints are necessary for proper instantiation. 
but you can just leave the nodes here and change the parameters with some other state's code. My rule of thumb is, if I need practically the same state with a bunch of animations that are being switched by resource system and other layers, I won't instation the scenes of this move. But at the moment I need to change more than three parameters, or I need to change the backend animation of the move, I understand that I have here similar but different states and I will add it separately. Considering repost implementation, here is the fastest I could throw together. Parrot state pushes humanoid into parrot humanoid group. Then repost as contextual input is obviously a combo that I put into parrot state to queue from and into an idle state in case we find some parrot humanoid after a short movement. The trigger logic here is straightforward as fuck, it just searches parrot humanoids in close proximity. Repost is obviously classified as a grab, so if done right I'd probably have some communication interchange between victim and a reposter, but let's be honest. Repost is like 10th priority thing that I used to make a bunch of people watch an architecture video. 